61. Isaiah chapter 61. This is our last lesson on this um, uh, series, Lord, I Need Help. And today this lesson is very sensitive. Uh, a lot of the facts I took, they're not mine. I just had to do a study on it and look into those things. Uh, but we're going to talk today about the problem of, Lord, I have a problem with abuse. And today we're going to look at that, different types of abuse. So I had to do a little deep search on that. But this is our last lesson on this topic, Lord, I need help. So let's look at the Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord had anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that, uh, that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture. What a wonderful, powerful passage. I pray tonight, Lord, is a sensitive topic, sensitive. We all need to hear it, including me, myself, too. And I pray, Father, for someone here or on social media that is not saved and never received Jesus Christ as personal Savior today they may call upon you for salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So tonight I'm going to... Touching a topic that is um, sensitive, is a problem of abuse, and is the pro they, they, I mean, the, there's many problems of abuse, so Lord, I need help, uh, and I, I hope that no one here suffers from this. Uh, I'm not preaching to, per se, to any person here. I'm just preaching a lesson the Lord laid in my heart, and I had to do some study here in some things, some things that I have to look into it because I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist, I'm not a, a, author, a police officer, I'm not that, so I'm just a preacher. So I get all this information, and I'm going to share with you tonight about this problem of abuse, because it's a predominant problem in every generation of people. People suffer from with those things. So for sake of introduction, today we come to the end of our series and how God helps you with your problems. For an example, uh, uh, so far we looked at the problem of anger, envy, Worry, depression, fear, pride, self-image. And last week, of course, we look at the problem of addiction. So we look at all these problems, and tonight, of course, is our last one. We could choose many topics, but we're going to stop here and go to something else. So today, uh, tonight is our last topic in our, in our series, and it's probably, I think, the most sensitive one uh, uh, topic in this series. And also, uh, it, it is also one that overlaps with many uh, uh, of other preceding topics. But anyway... I think this is a very sensitive topic, and believe me, it, it's very uh, sensitive to me as well. So um, let me preach this to you tonight. So let's look at, for several points tonight, about this problem of, Lord, I have a problem with abuse. Uh, number one there on your outline, the problem of abuse. We begin by looking at the problem of abuse. On the, this headline, we will look at various uh, things tonight, but uh, there is a problem of abuse. Uh, and there's many uh, ways. It's there are physical abuse, there are um, uh, verbal abuse, there are sexual abuse. There are different types of abuse. We're going to talk at this, uh, think about these topics tonight. We're going to expound this topic. We're going to look at the problem of abuse. Then we're going to see the solution. What can do? What can we do? Both for the abuser and the abused. What can be done? So letter A: types of abuse. Abuse can be physical can be physical abuse. Uh, and those who suffer from that literally are children, elderly people. Uh, they suffer from those things. They're the most vulnerable people are the younger people and the elderly people because they cannot defend themselves. And verbal, so we have physical abuse, we have the verbal abuse, emotional abuse, and of course, all sexual abuse. So the first of all, the various types of abuse here, the main type, of abuse that falls on the physical, verbal, emotion, and sexual abuse. So here, let's say, well, give me a thing right here. Physical abuse is the, is the use of physical force or violence that results in bodily injury or harm. Uh, is right there in your outline. I know you have a long outline, and I 
I thank Caitlin uh, for her uh, hard work. She came to me and said, Pastor, that outline is long. I said, I know. <laughs> I, uh, I am sorry. If you desire any of those topics, if you've been preaching, say, Pastor, could I have that message? Just let me know. I print it out for you and give it to you. All right? It's not my message to keep. It's God's message. You give it to me. I give it to you. I have no problem with that. So physical abuse includes such things as hitting, pushing, kicking, uh, uh, punching, scratching, biting. Choking, throwing objects at a, at a person, or, or the use of any weapon against that, uh, another person. The Bible clearly states that physical abuse is wrong in all circumstances. All right? Okay, go to Psalm chapter 11, verse 5. We're going to give you a lot, of, we got a, a lot of gospel, a lot of Bible tonight. Uh, it says there, uh, be flip, you know, if you have an electronically, if you have on your, on your Bible paper, just know you go, go along, you might want to write it down and Check it later or however you want to do, but I'll wait for you, okay? All right, so it says, uh, it says there, the word, the Lord tried the righteous, but the wicked and, and him that loveth violence is so what? Hate it. God doesn't like violence. Just a word to any single woman here tonight, all right? Be very careful to whom you date. All right? If that guy tried to be physical with you, walk away as fast as you can and say, I mean, because when a, a man puts a hand to a woman, he already lost the respect. Right. That guy got to go. Yeah. Yeah. I told my son-in-law, respect my daughter the way I respect my wife, because if I ever hear that you put my hand, your hands in my daughter, you're going to see me at your front door. I told him that, and you know what? I didn't, didn't regret it because, you know what? You do not put your hands on another person like that. So my, that was my thought to the single ladies. So uh, look what it says here in Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man that shall not go. If you see the warning signs, run. Don't walk away. Run away. All right? Verbal abuse is the use of words that hurt another person. We go from physical to verbal. So verbal abuse includes such things as yelling, shouting, insulting, accusing, blaming, threatening, name-calling, and the use of profanity to get the point across. Verbal abuse is also wrong according to Scripture. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. What God tells us to do there. Ephesians, I know you probably know this verse by heart. Look what God says there in Ephesians 4.29. Let now corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good and the use of edifying, that you may minister grace unto the hearers. So God says right here, commands us, don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And those things that I mentioned before, yelling, shouting, and so, that's all corrupt communication. Emotion abuse is the use of negative behaviors to cause mental or emotional anguished in another person. So emotion abuse includes such things as threatening, bullying, intimidating, controlling, manipulating, degrading, or humiliating another person. It can also include uh, re uh, rejecting or withholding appropriate love and affection for another person. That's emotion abuse. So this is, see, this, you see that's the different types of abuse? Let's go to sexual abuse. So sexual abuse is any form of non-consensual sex, uh, sexual activity. So sexual abuse includes such things as unwanting kissing or touching, sexual assault, rape or attempt to rape, child molestation, showing children pornography or engaging in sexual activity for, uh, in front of a child. That's, that's the, st the, st the type of stuff. So obviously all types of abuse are wrong and are completely forbidden by God in the Bible. So those things are wrong and we should not engage in those things. And so they, they, unfortunately, this very predominant in our world on which people get arrested all the time for those things. So let it, uh, let it be victims of abuse. Who are the victims of abuse? Who are they? The three main victims of abuse are this. You ready? Spouses, children, elderly people. Those are the most victimized people. Domestic violence, it is a big thing in our world. So domestic violence is very predominant in our society. Many women have become victims of abuse in their marriages. 
But, but we must not stay here because there's a lot of abuse also committed by a woman towards this spouse. It's not just one way. It's, uh, either the one way is the most predominant way, but it's also the other way around. So it is predominant thing in our society. God calls spousal abuse a breaking faith with your spouse. When you abuse your spouse, you're breaking your promise to love, honor, protect her or him in, in, in all those things. So on the spousal abuse, unfortunately, we must also uh, uh, list domestic uh, partner's abuse. Of course, because we live in a society that people are living, they're not married, they're just living together. I call that shacking up together. Okay, so, uh, so many people are living that way these days, and they say, what's wrong with that picture? You know, with you and the same thing that every married people do. No, you're not. You know, you're not blessed by God. You're not married. You're living in sin. Yeah. So, in fact, st statistically speak, uh, uh, living together instead of marriage actually increasing, increases abuse. According to one Justice Department study, couples living together are 62%, listen to this, more likely than, uh, likely than, than married couples to suffer abuse from their partner. Wow. Child abuse is betrayal of the love, protection, and care that all adults owe to the children under their supervision. We sing the song, Jesus loved the little children, and he does. Jesus had harsh words for anyone who would, uh, would bring harm to a child. Actually, I want you to read this. Go to Matthew 18, chapter 5. I want you to see that. You know, so you know why we have little children being abused left and right out there in our nation and throughout the world, and many times not even reported. And they have no way to run. Look what it says in Matthew 5, 18, 5. And who shall receive one such little child in my name receive it whom? Me. But who shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me? It were better for him that a millstone will hang about his neck and that he will drown in the depth of the sea. You know? Children are weak and vulnerable members of society and we must do all we can to protect their personhood and guard their conscience. Let me put it like this. You know little kids are people? Mad. They are little citizens, but they're people. Right. And you know what? We got to respect those little guys right. and little girls. We do respect them for who they are. They were grown up to be adults. You will become the mayors and the presidents and the mothers and fathers and, and, and everything else that, that we, who we are today. We respect those little guys. You know, well, but you don't understand. No, 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 I do understand. They, they, you know, they, they, they're full of life full of energy, drive you, drive you crazy, and you can't keep up with them, but still, you know what? You were the same time, the same way at one time. So children are weak and vulnerable, and we need to be protected. So elderly abuse is a betrayal of the honor and respect we own uh, to those who have gone before us. Let me tell you this. All the elderly people, they can't defend themselves. We need to honor them, protect them, because they cannot defend themselves. Did you notice how much of abuse takes place within the home? The sad reality is that the home is the most dangerous place you can, uh, can be outside of the battlefield. You say, really? Listen to this. Between 2015 and 2021, 60% of all violent injuries in this country were inflicted by loved ones or acquaintance in the home. And 60% of, of, time, of time, those injuries happen, like I said, in the home. Honor and respect those who are elderly. Respect them and understand that one day you will be in their feet as well. You would be an elderly person as well. Let us see. Prevalence of abuse. Prevalence of abuse. What about the prevalence of abuse? We would like to think that abuse is rare and only happens to certain uh, pockets of society. But nothing could be further from the truth. Abuse is a widespread in society and sadly always banned. Is widespread. Sometimes we don't even imagine what, take, what should be taking place, and you know, like on that family would never happen. It does happen. I'll give you a story. There was a lady one time that walked in the pastor's office. I shared this here before. Black eyes, broken nose, bleeding everywhere, walks in the church, and the pastor goes, lifts up, looks at her, and says, What happened to you? I'm not going to say any names. What happened to you? She said, I just want you to see what I've been suffering all these years. 
Now, regardless, this man, the, her husband is a deacon in the church. And she said, he said, who did this? My husband. He said, why? He said, Pastor, this is not the first time. That's why sometimes I stay home months on end. Because the beatings that he gives me. The husband who was a nice looking guy, very happy and joyful in the church. But at home, he was an animal. What a sad thing. Sometimes we would not think that would come from there. We're like, oh, never happy. You know what? It's spread abroad in society. We never know. So, honor and respect those who are elderly. Respect them. So, the, the prevalence of abuse. If I give you that, uh, we would think, like I said, we never know where it comes. Abuse is a widespread in society, in society and sadly always been. Violence is part of a sinful human nature, and it was the main reason God sent the flood early in history. Why? Because the wickedness of man's heart. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 6. I want you to see something there. Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. Why God sent a flood? Because of the wickedness of man's heart. Look what it says there in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. The earth, are you there? Okay. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with what? Violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupt, was corrupt, uh, uh, corrupt his ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of, of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is, is filled with violence uh, through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So a lot of violence. So the statistics are staggering, folks. One, one in four women, listen to this, will experience domestic violence during her lifetime. Women experience more than, more than 4 million physical assaults and rapes because of their partners, and men are victims of nearly 3 million physical assaults as well. So every year, one in three women uh, who is victim of, hum uh, I'm, say, I'm sorry, one in three women who is a victim of homicide is murdered by her current or former partner. And the scariest statistics of all is this, most domestic violence or incidents are never reported. It happened, but nobody knows. Abuse is not a problem. It is out there somewhere. And right now, as we're speaking, somebody's being abused. So it is in our neighborhoods. It is in our schools. It is in our workplaces. It is in our homes. It is in our churches. And God sees every single incident out there of abuse taking place. Listen, in my job, it is zero tolerance. I love it in a way. You know why? Because people are not to look down on other people. You know, so there was a guy one time that said this. He, he was not being very nice, and he said, this is a shipyard. We've been here. And look at him. I said, no, this is a place of work, and you need to respect your fellow men. We need to respect them. Now, it don't matter where you are always. We need to respect those who are made in the image of God. So let it be uh, the effects of abuse. What about the effects of abuse? Proverbs 55 is a sum about David and his enemies, but also if you look at it, it might, just, might take something out of it about the horrors of domestic abuse. Go to Psalm 55. Let's, let's look at something there. So David was being, was being chased by whom? Saul. He was running for his life. Look what it says there in verse 4. My heart is so painted, uh, painted, I'm sorry, within me. And the terrors of that are following upon me. You see the fear of what's going on in the heart of David? And it says, uh, Fear, uh, uh, fearfulness and, and trembling uh, come upon me, and horror had overwhelmed me. This man is overwhelmed by what he's going through. What do you think is going in the heart of those who are being abused? David, uh, some describes the suffering and anguish of when someone who should be looking out for you instead abuses you and brings you harm. You know, parents are abusing their kids, and their kids go like, you know, the kids have to look, looking out to their parents for support and protection. Survivors of domestic violence face rare rates of depression, sleep disturbance, anxiety, flashbacks, and other emotional distress. Domestic violence contributes to a poor, listen to this, poor health for many survivors. For an example, chronic conditions like heart disease, and many other diseases come upon people that suffer from, from domestic violence. 
among or abuse, among women brought to emergency rooms due to domestic violence, most were socially isolated and had fewer social and financial resources than other women not injured because of domestic violence. Domestic violence costs more than $37 billion a year in law, with, with law enforcement involved, legal work, medical and mental health treatments, and loss of, uh, of course, in pre, pre, uh, produ uh, production in, I'm sorry, in companies. So number one. Number two, we see understanding abuse. Let's look. Let's understand abuse. All right? Why do people abuse other people? Because they have a wicked heart? No. I would say so. No. I think we can all agree that abuse is a major problem in society. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. It's a major problem in society. We will talk about dealing with abuse in just a few minutes, but let's keep going down. You will notice that, uh, and I, uh, that I'm mostly using the masculine pronoun right here for the abuser and the feminine pronoun for the abuse. The, but let me, let's, let's put it this way. That happened the opposite way too. There are many women who abuse men or abuse children. You know, it's not just one way. It's both ways, even though predominantly it's the other way. So number one, we see the abuser. The abuser. We see manipulative, controlling. We need, we, need, we need to understand the abuser himself. There are characteristics of a person that is abusive. There, but three most common are the abuser is critical, is manipulative and controlling. And an abuser, a, a, a person that is an abuser, the abuser is harshly critical and judgmental of others. This is both, uh, 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 both a defense mechanism for himself, but also increases the damage of, of, uh, to the abused to, uh, to, uh, to others, and they live under the harsh judgmentalism of the abuser. So the abuser is extremely manipulative. The abuser will deny all responsibility for the abused and shift all the blame to the victim instead. And the victim eventually blames themselves for it. Okay? So... Um, for an example, let me give you an example here. The rapist blames the victim for dressing seductively. She caused me to do that because the way she was dressing. Really? That usually happens that way. The physical abuser blames the victim for making him mad. She got me mad and I can control myself. Uh, abusers are skillful manipulators of the truth and ex experts of deception. If you go to the ACI, you know more, all, the, all the guys that they are women, they all get innocent. You tell those pe preachers that go there, they're all innocent. That's amazing what they try to manipulate. The abuser is harshly controlling. The abuser will, uh, will uh, uh, intimidate his victims to keep them from telling the truth. The abuser may, may threaten bodily harm to the victim of the victim's loved ones unless he gets what he wants. The abuser is normally jealous and possessive. Abuse is all, is all about control, and, 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 and abusers seek to control their victims in any way they can. Now, let it be the abused. Let's look at the abused. Isolation, hopelessness, shame. Next, we need to understand the abused. There are many characteristics uh, of abused people, abused persons, but there are three most common is isolation, hopelessness, and shame. So the abused person tends to isolate themselves and withdraw from people. They don't want people to know what's going on. They don't want, so they're quiet. They don't want to know. They don't want somebody to know. She may speak in terms of trying to, to stay hidden and making himself invisible in, uh, to social s situations. Abuse, abuse often affects the victim's ability to make friends and engage in a healthy relationship. The abused person often behaves in ways that are uncomfortable for other people, for the, uh, uh, increasing her isolation. The abused, abused person uh, uh, often have a hard time making friends. So the abused person uh, disconnects from others and finds it difficult to, 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 to trust people. This also affects her spiritual uh, or that person's spiritual uh, 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 way of life. So the abused person also expresses uh, severe hopelessness. They feel trapped. They feel hopelessness in their heart. So the abused person feels 
powerless to change her situation or his situation and loses all hope for the future. Or, uh, over time, she becomes emotionally uh, passive and numb to the, to the fact. This is a result of overwhelming trauma and is a self-defense against further emotional hurt. Instead of feeling pain, uh, he or she simply feels nothing at all. A sense of hopelessness also can lead to increased of dependency on, listen to this, on the abuser. Abused children especially feel this, this sense of hopelessness and powerlessness, and, they, and, they, and then there is shame. Shame is the emotional undercurrents of every abuse, abused relationship. Shame that the, abu the abuse is happening. Shame that you can, can't stop it. Shame that you can't walk away. So the abused person will often include, conclude that they are to blame. That's the problem. I'll tell you what, uh, uh, in many situations of life and with children involved, the children begin to blame themselves, especially if they're being abused, it's their fault. Whatever happens, it's their fault. So shame is perhaps the most powerful of the negative emotions and has a shaping effect in the rest of uh, their lives. Let us see, under, understanding the cycle of abuse. You want to see how abuse goes? Number one is tension builds. Number two, acting out. Number three, reconciliation or honeymoon. That's what the abuser does. The tension is built, the acting out of it, then they try to make peace. And the cycle repeats itself again. It goes over and over again. We have spent time trying, looking at this thing, but first there is the tension built. During that, this phase, various stress built up for the abuser and the abused. So the phrase may, may be brief or long, lasting hours, sometimes days and months. However, the tension eventually builds up to the point that the abuser acts out. The acting out phases, uh, uh, phases is re relatively brief, and the abuser reduces tension by either physically, verbally, emotionally, or sexually abusing the victim. This is then followed by reconciliation or a honeymoon. And during this phase, the balance of power has shift, and the abuser often feels guilty or fearful of losing his relationship with the victim. The abuser apologizes uh, profoundly and promises, I will never do it again. Remember, the cycle goes back again. The victim feels pain, fear, humiliation, disrespect, confusion, and may wrongly feel responsible for it. However, the victim also feels that, that relief, that peace, or the tension is gone until the next time. And it happens again. So it's a cycle which goes on, and many times it's unreported because it keeps going. And so the abuser keeps Keeps going on, on the, uh, the, the, the abuser keeps going on the victim and keeps doing that and keeps going over. And the victim itself begins to blame himself, he or she, whoever the person is. So you see that cycle. I tell you what, is this reality? Folks, it is reality. It happens every day in our world. It happens every day in our country. It happens in families that you don't even dream about or think about. But it happens. Now, number three, dealing with abuse. How we deal with these things. So how do we deal with the problem of abuse? God doesn't want you to go through the cycle of abuse. He has given you instructions in His Word to help you with the problem of abuse. So if you are a person, you, you think that you're being abused, and you, know, you think you have no way out, you, you just have to live it out the way it is, and there's no help for you. Let me tell you this, that is help for you. All right, that is help for you. You and God didn't, didn't put you in this world for you to be abused by someone else. You ready for that? Let's look at the abuser. The abuser needs two. First of all, all for ins uh, instructions for abuser. Let's look at the abuser. The abuser needs two. Let's look at the abuser. The abuser needs to accept full responsibility for the abuse. You know what? This thing about it's not my fault. Yeah, I was raised this way. You know, I'm a victim. You know what? It doesn't work. You know what? You stand up and accept your responsibility. You're guilty. You did it. Look what it says in 1 John chapter 8. If we say that we have no sin, we, do, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in what? In us. 
is that we, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just, forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I was talking with our missionary, the, the, the prison ministry, he said, oh, when you go to prison, you have to have a strong mind. And I said, why? Because everybody's innocent there. Nobody's guilty. I already heard that story before. I never walked in one of those places, but wow. But I tell you what, the abuser needs to admit to come to a point, you know what, if he wants to have forgiveness from God, to admit that I did it, I'm responsible for it. Number, number two, be accountable to others. He needs to be accountable to others. Luke says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any, uh, any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily why it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of what? Sin. So you are caught in a dangerous cycle, and you need to be accountable to others. You are hurting somebody. You're hurting another human being. Number three, learn to control anger or urges. Learn to control anger or urges. I work with a man in my job. He was like a bomb ready to explode. You just approach him or any little thing. That guy would start screaming, and he would grab anything to throw at you just immediately. He was violent with his anger. And he came to me one time. He said, what can you do to help me? I cannot control this thing. I said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. I said, you know what? I quoted him, be slow to speak and slow to anger. Be slow to speak and slow to anger. You know why he left his job? He was forced to retire because... He went in one of the rooms with most people hang out. We call the, the tool room where people go get special tools. And he, there, he threatened to kill people. And he knew he made a mistake. Because when you're so angry like that, you say things you don't mean to or you really mean to. And people took him serious. And he came to our department and said, I got to get out of here as fast as I can because I know what's going on. I'm going to be arrested today. And he laughed his question. And in the way home, he called, and he said, he called the office, and he said, I'm retiring today. He knew what he did. You know what? Anger out of control. So we need, to, we need to learn to control our anger and our urges because it is through anger and through bursts of, of, of urge that, that way because we think we're right and everybody else is wrong on which we victimize people. How many wives been violently attacked by their husbands because I was angry, angry and she didn't listen? Well, buddy, you know what? Get your anger out there and leave the person alone. That's not a right thing to do. Communication goes a long way. You see, if you're caught in a dangerous cycle, you need to be accountable for that. Number, so, I mean, number three, see, I, say, I said uh, anger. So look what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and claim and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And look what God says. Be kind one to another, tender heart, forgiven one another, even as Christ. What it says, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. See, what God wants us to be kind, loving. In a home, whatever we go, workplace. Anger out of control. I remember one time, two guys in my job, I knew this kid very well, walking by, and he was angry, out of control, angry. And I said to him, I said, he comes to me, and started talking to him, I said, whoa, calm down, calm down, sit here, calm down, calm down, sit here. He said, you don't know what happened to me. Said, what happened to you? That guy over there chose a, threw a coffee at me. I said, all right, all right, okay, sit down. What did you do? He didn't throw coffee at you just because of the sake of throwing a coffee at you. What did you do? He, you don't understand. No, 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 no. Just tell me. What, I was trying to prevent something. What did you do? He never told me what he did. I said, listen, you need to clock out. You need to go home. Because you're going to do something you're going to regret for the rest of your life. Just calm down, all right? I walked away, and it happened. 
He, his anger was so high and so big, he went to the guy, knock him out. Now what happened to him? Got arrested, out the door, lost his job. Now he's facing charges. Anger out of control. We need to control those anger bursts, you know. And then like, you know, a person like that more than likely goes home and somebody at home is going to suffer because he's right and everybody else is wrong. So, learn to control your anger. Number four, work through the underlying issues for lasting change. Finally, you need to work through the underlying issues for lasting change. There's something driving you abuse, something that you don't want to face or admit, but until you deal with it, it will never, you will never big break free. You're going to have the tendency to abuse people all the time. Let it be. The abused. What about the victim? What should a victim do? Let's look at the victim. All right. If you're a victim of abuse of any way, look, look what you need to do. You need to, a safe place to go, letter A. You need a safe place to go. First of all, an abused person needs a safe place to go. If you have experienced abuse, you can probably relate to David's words here in Psalm 55. But it, I am, if you abuse, find a safe place to go. Don't stay there because you say, oh, things are going to get better. They won't get bad unless the person changes ways and repent and regret and just change their way of life. Otherwise, you're going to be victimized over and over again, and you're going to feel guilty that you are the one that causes the problem. It's not you, it's the other person. So, find a place to a safe place to go. God didn't put you in this world for somebody to use you as an instrument of abuse. Okay. If an abused person comes to you for help, your first responsibility is to get them in a safe place. If there are children involved, they need to protection as well. If you are an abused person, you need to find a place of safety. This comes first before any other steps uh, uh, following that. But here's one thing. You need to get out of there for your sake. Why do you think sometimes it happens that eventually a wife or a spouse can happen the other way around is been killed by the spouse? That person never left. And things got, got worse and worse and worse. Because I tell you what, this is me. When a man puts a hand on a woman in a physical way, it's just the first step to get worse. You never cross that line because you have to respect the other person. Same thing with children. There's a way to discipline the child. There's another way to abuse the child. You follow that? Two differences right here. Okay, so you need a safe place to go. Number two, compassion and support. Compassion and support. Too often the abused person is met with criticism, downplay, and all disbelief. They will only drive them deeper into a cycle of abuse. We have to care and show that we care about those who've been victimized by, by the abuser. Look what it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Somebody comes to you and say, you know, so and, um, this thing's going on in my life. And you say, I'll be praying for you. That's great help, isn't it? I'll be praying for you. You know, I wish you well. No, you need to get that person in a safe place. You need to help that person. Number three, long-term counsel and care. Look what it says in Proverbs 32, 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt confess about my songs of deliverance. Selah. So the, long, the Lord responds in verse 8, uh, right here in Psalm, uh, verse, uh, 32, uh, Psalm 32, verse 8, says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou uh, shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. God, you see, uh, if, if is a, a person that is, we put them in a place of safety, but also a lot of these people, they need long-term counseling because all the stuff that has been done to them. Let me put it this way. Remember years, a few years back there was a, a man, I forgot his name. He went to this family's house through the window. He grabbed the dead daughter out of that room and up in the woods celebrate some type of a marriage. It was up in California. 
It was, yeah, and, and she was walking through the street. Nobody knew who she was. For years, she's been who abused was a young girl. And imagine when, and, and she got found and it came to home to her parents. Can you imagine all the therapy and counseling that young woman went through? Had to. So there is a, a, a long-term counseling for those people that have been abused, both physically, emotionally, and all those things. Number four, time to heal and forgive. Finally, the abuse, abused person needs time to heal and to forgive. There's no quick fix for abuse. The damage has been taking place for over a long time, and the healing will take place over and over, but God will heal you. I remember... Uh, there was a couple in my Sunday school class when we were going to First Baptist. I was teaching that class. And I forgot what lesson we were going through. And this, I think she was courageous and bold even to share such story. She was sexually raped by her father over and over again. She never reported. She got married. She talked to her husband about it. Even before they got married, she said. She had little kids. And she said, I had no peace. So she decided to go, her, her husband, and her kids, drove to the father's house, knock on the door. He opened the door and she said to him, I will forgive you, or I forgive you. And she walked away. Now let me put it this way. It was easy. Imagine yourself there. No, it was not. That was her daddy. That was no stepdad, it was her daddy. Someone that she looked up to. I can't, I can't, she was saying that she was crying, and I'll tell you what, she wanted to have peace in her heart, and she needed to make a closure on that thing. Did she have a back to him and have a relationship with him? No. But she had to go to him and say, I forgive you. I think the abuser had to come to a point in her life, or in his life, I'd say, you know what? I forgive you. I'm going to move on. It's a time to heal and time to forgive. Look what it says in Psalm 147, verse 3. He healed the broken in hearts and binded up their wounds. You cannot rush the progress. Healing and forgiveness are, are not a switch that you turn, turn on and off. Sometimes there's a lot of pain there, and it takes time to heal. What about the church? What does the church must do to these type of people? when they're being abused. So let us see, is the church must. Let's look at the church. What a church must do in order to do this? Should we just neglect it or ignore it? Number one, protect victims of abuse. First of all, the church must protect the victims of abuse. God commands us to do that. Go to Psalm chapter, I mean, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 11. Psalm 24, 11. So, look what it says in there. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew, we knew it not, thou now it that, that pondering the heart consider it, and he that keep this, uh, thy soul uh, do it not, uh, do not he know it, and shall not he render it to every man according to his works? You see, the church should not ignore what's going on. We should not say, oh, come over here, let's pray for you. I wish things are going to get better. Oh, no. Number two, provide necessary support. Secondly, the church must provide necessary support. The church must help the weak, which includes providing necessary physical, emotion, and financial support where we can. They have been victimized, and they need your help. We're not doctors or, or psychiatrists, but we must, with the little research that we, resources that we have, we have, we have, we can help as much as we can, or we help as much as we can. So what we do, we help them as much as we can, love them and care for them. We got to do that. Number three, each biblical roles, each biblical roles and, and relationships. Thirdly, the church must teach biblical rules and relationships. We said the primary victim of abuse are elderly, then children and spouses. The Bible gives clean structures for each of these relationships. Doesn't it? 
We are to honor our parents. We are to honor those that are elderly. We are to love the little children. You know what? Uh, spouses are to care for one another, not to be battlefields, you know, in the home. So, so we see this concerning elderly. Go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. Concerning the elderly. Let's, let's, let, let's see what God says there. Look what it says there. In Proverbs, I mean, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32, it says, Thou shalt rise up before the hooray head, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God. Look what it says, I am the Lord. Concerning children, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, and bring them up in a nourishment and admonition of the Lord. You know your children are really your children? You say, they're my children. Yeah. Who gave them to you? God gave them to you. What is your job? Raise them up. Train them up the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from what you teach them. Some of them go astray because of the bad friends they hang around. But you did your job. Mom, dad, if you're here and your children are following the ways of the Lord, don't feel guilty. If you teach them everything you could, they made the decision. But let me tell you, our job is to train our kids. When they're old, they're responsible for their own actions. But let me tell you, we are give, they're given to, God gave them to us to train them, to, to help them up, and when they're old, they go on their way. Now concerning spouses, abuse, abusive spouses often distort the biblical teaching of husband-wife roles in the home. They wrongly tell their wives they must submit or else. Husbands, love your wives, the Bible says, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So, is the role of the, the husband to love his wife, not to be the battlefield. The, the, the wife was not to marry that man so she can be abused by him all the time. That's not what a marriage is about. Number four, be safe. Be a safe a place for all. Be a safe place for all. Finally, the church must be a safe place for all. There is a reason we call this a sanctuary. Why? The church gathers us to reflect on the beauties of God's presence where we are all safe in the dwelling and the, and the shelter of his tabernacle. So, it is hope for the abuser? Is there hope for the abuser? Yes, it is. God can forgive. Of course, there's ramifications about it. Is, is there hope for the abused? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. But there's going to be a lot of pain there, a lot of suffering there, and it takes a long time to get over that. I tell you what, it is in both ways, but let me tell you, there is, this stuff is keeping going on even in our world, even as I speak. Many people are being abused. We had covered a lot of ground in these past months. We did. We have dealt with some difficult issues, and my hope is that, that you have an understanding, and I conclude with this, you have an understanding how God helps uh, us with our problems. We have many different problems. Maybe it's, it's pride, maybe it's fear, maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's worry, but what about abuse? Don't let nobody, let put it to this, nobody, let nobody either physical, emotionally, or verbally abuse you. No, no, you are a person made in the image of God. And we are to respect one another. We should never try to abuse others or others abuse us. And we should never allow that to happen. You know why? Because we are to be respected. People in society look at status quo. You know what? In the eyes of God, we're all the same at the foot of the cross. We need to respect our fellow men. We need to respect the little ones. We need to respect the elderly. We need to respect each other. That's the right way to live. If we do that, abuse will stop. We'll stop in the home. We'll stop in the workplaces. We'll stop in churches. We'll stop in the neighborhood. We'll stop everywhere. If we respect each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. We can learn so much from it. And, Lord, for this topic of abuse. There's many ways of abuse, Lord. And, unfortunately, you know more than I know. I'm just a, a person. You know, Lord, how many people are being abused as I'm speaking, Lord. Many people. Domestic abuse, Lord, all kinds of abuses going on out there. And Lord, my heart goes to those people who are being abused by others. Lord, I pray, Father, help us as a church to have a, sens a sensitive heart towards this, that we uh, 
Take care of those who have been abused by others, Lord. And help us to be a safe haven to those people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.